Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Graham. Uh, I'm here to talk about a hot new topic on the internet, bytecode assembly languages. Who doesn't know a 15-year-old who's interested in that? Um, professionally, as you said, I'm a software engineer at Etsy. Uh, just to clarify, this is a personal project, not an Etsy project. Just want to preempt anyone tweeting, Etsy's ditching PHP. Um, so don't get me in trouble. Uh, it's still experimental, um, but I hope you'll find some notable things about it nonetheless. So again, Qbert is a bytecode assembly language and virtual machine. And the reason I wanted to write it is to make writing other programming, programming languages easier, to make it so, to take the, the difficult parts of implementing the execution of a programming language and push them down into the virtual machine so the client languages don't need to implement those features themselves. Uh, and also, I'm trying to take uh, you know, a bunch of disparate features that, that I've found useful in other programming language environments and recombine them into uh, a single virtual machine, Qbert. And uh, the last thing then is novel. So there's some novel error handling that I'll get into later. So when I get to that section, uh, look out for that. All right, so it may not surprise you. I didn't set out to, to write uh, bytecode assembly language. Um, I take this as a positive sign because so many successful software projects usually have something accidental in them at some point, so I'm starting off with that. Uh, and let me go back a minute to just explain how, how this happened. So uh, this is what computers looked like when I started with them, and they were, they were slow megahertz. And then we started making them faster, uh, <laughs> largely by making them faster. Uh, so, you know, they were going to keep getting faster, right? That was the expectation. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. Um, the hardware engineers were like, no, nah, it's too hard. Uh, so they, they found a way to weasel out of making them faster, and that is just to say, we're going to make more of them. Um, so what that let them do is say, hey, look, chips are better. They're now, you now have two cores instead of one. Uh, and if that's a problem, it's a software problem. So. <laughs> Good luck, guys. Uh, so suddenly we have concurrency. Um, the problem with that is, here's a quote from Joe Armstrong, uh, programming languages reflect the hardware they were designed for. Uh, I think I actually misquoted that. I forgot to write it down. It's exactly right. <laughs> Ask me for the, for the exact quote later. Uh, it was something like that, though. <laughs> Uh, and so the problem with that is most of the programming languages that we use today uh, were designed and implemented in the context of software getting faster by chips having higher clock speeds, uh, which is no longer the case. Chips have more, uh, more cores and that are not necessarily faster. So what that means is it's great for us. Uh, it's time for us to you know, do, have some interesting problems taking old programming languages and retrofitting them to concurrency, uh, designing new ones that are built from the beginning to have better support for concurrency. Uh, so everyone's having fun uh, who's in this industry, except for one person. Uh, Joe, Joe Armstrong is the creator of Erlang. He's like, what took you all so long? Uh, so these issues with concurrency uh, led me to want to uh, build a, a functional programming language, a new, a new language that handled concurrency better, handled the, uh, the error handling better, like I was talking about. Uh, and that programming language is called Jazz, but I'm not going to talk about that because, uh, well, that's, uh, that's an example that I'll use as a client language, but what happened is I started working on the virtual machine for, for Jazz, and uh, I'm working on the virtual machine, trying to get it to execute, and I'm thinking this would be a lot easier to test and debug and just understand and, and make it work better if, uh, if it had its own assembly language. So I started working on that then, and that also has an interesting pr uh, property where it allows the virtual machine to have an interface that any, any language can target, um, any other client language can target, and then be interoperable between them. Uh, so now I was developing two programming languages. Okay, so Qbert, what's it about? Um, first, well, where does it fit? Um, Qbert, uh, any programming language would compile to Qbert assembly language, 
And then the computer, uh, Qubit uh, compiler will compile that to the bytecode. And the virtual machine will execute that and run it and interact with the operating system and something. This is basically the same place in the stack that the JVM fits. All right. So the goal then is to also provide interoperability and let any programming language that, that someone might write to target Qbert interact and be callable from others. So what are the applications that I'm looking for here? Um, I'm a server-side developer, web developer. Etsy's a website. Uh, that kind of thing. So those are the problems that I'm most looking to solve. Um, but also, it should be just generic, right? It should be uh, usable as any kind of uh, language virtual machine. And one of the other things that DSLs, everyone, you know, we always talk about DSLs, but th they're not used that often. And one of the reasons they're not used is it's difficult to go from a DSL to code execution. And so the hope here is that we, by making it easy to s sort of support all the code execution and target the code execution, you can implement a lot less in the DSL part of the, the system. Uh, and one actually common DSL that we use is template languages. A lot of these languages compile to Java or PHP or some other language or are interpreted uh, at runtime by, by Ruby or Python. Um, but we can also just take those languages and comp compile them straight to, uh, to the bytecode of the virtual machine. All right, and it should be embeddable as a concurrency li library also to provide uh, concurrency to other languages that don't necessarily have it, but want to be able to have access to concurrency or asynchronous I.O. and the other features available. So these applications led me to these priorities. Um, number one, has to have good concurrency. Uh, if it's not going to have good concurrency, we've already got Java and C++, so that is covered. Um, and it's got to be interoperable. And there's a lot of people running web servers in the cloud now, and those web servers have low resources. So it can't be too memory intensive and needs to be built with that in mind. Uh, so down at the bottom here is, is straight line performance. That's less of a uh, priority. I'm sort of aiming to follow the, the path laid out by Java and Erlang and the hip hop VM, starting off as uh, an interpreted implementation and then you know, bringing in JIT comp compilation and performance enhancements later. All right, so the language priorities. It's an assembly language, um, but it's still got to be accessible. Uh, and the whole point is to be easy to use for language developers. So accessibility is the number one priority in, in the language, easy, easy to use. Uh, and it's got to be writable by the computer, um, which may lead to it being a little more verbose than a language that's meant to be writable by a human. Oops. Uh, and readable by the language designer. Whoever's building the, the client language needs to be able to look at the Qbert code that they've generated and be able to read it sufficiently to say, yes, that's what I wanted to do, or no, that's not what I wanted to do. And finally, debuggable in the client language. Um, an example is like CoffeeScript compiles to JavaScript, which then runs uh, in the browser or something. But when you're going to debug that, you're debugging JavaScript, which is kind of a problematic interface. So, uh, Qbert definitely needs to be um, debuggable in whatever client language it was implemented with, uh, which also then leads to really being read readable or writable by the client language developer, uh, the client language user anyway, um, not being much of a priority. Hopefully they don't need to know that Qbert is there or the, any of the assembly language. Just like uh, a Python developer or a C developer doesn't know, have to worry about the assembly language that their code generates, usually. OK, so there are some precedents. Uh, Parrot is uh, an example that tried to do this. Tried, try, is trying. I don't know if anyone is particular about that. Um, has, has not succeeded yet, at least. Uh, that is the, the virtual machine for Perl. It's also was, they were hoping to target Python uh, and maybe PHP. That hasn't really worked out. Um, the JVM is obviously supremely successful. Uh, tons of languages are supporting that, and it's in the similar, similar space. And then finally, uh, the language Elixir has demonstrated that Erlang can successfully host languages as well. So this is a big challenge to improve on these options, um, but I think there's, there's still room for, for one more language. Uh, otherwise, why would we all be here? All right, so some quick basics about uh, Qbert. 
It is uh, register-based, similar to Lua, Erlang, uh, some others. Um, it supports runtime polymorphism, static type information, uh, inline asynchronous I.O., so that means asynchronous I.O. without callbacks, uh, so it, you just have to say read, write, read, write, and the virtual machine handles the scheduling, so you don't have to uh, build, generate uh, callbacks, or even worse, have users write callbacks. Uh, and it also supports pattern matching, because that's, that's great. Anyone, pattern matching is great. I just want to plug pattern matching real quick. All right. All right, so here's some code uh, and features. It's a programming language, so I definitely want to show code. Uh, it's an assembly language, so I'm going to try to keep it to a minimum. <laughs> All right, got to see Hello World, um, of course, for any programming language. The, this is pretty simple. Uh, the first line declares the main function that returns void. The second line uh, loads the, the print function into a, a register, and the third line loads the hello world constant into the first parameter of the print function, and then the fourth line calls it. So that's it. It's pretty simple. Obviously, it's, it's more than most languages, but again, it's an assembly language, so that's verbosity will come with that a little bit. Uh, here's hello world in Swedish. Um, that's one of the nice things about a virtual machine is it handles stuff like UTF-8 for you. Obviously not unique to Qbert. All right, so I've talked a lot about concurrency. Um, there are two, two models for concurrency in Qbert. Uh, process, whoa, processes and forks. Um, get into those in a bit. First, I uh, already spilled the beans on this. Workers. Workers are sort of more of a system, Qbert system level thing. They're not really code related. Uh, it's just one CPU to, to a worker, and the worker handles the scheduling and stuff like that. So then with, within a uh, worker, zoom into that, each worker has multiple processes, uh, probably more than three, but that's all that fit on the slide. And a process is similar to an Erlang process. It's, um, if you're familiar with Erlang, it's very similar to that. It's a new, new call stack, so it's not related to uh, the calling or the creating uh, process at all. And processes interact with each other via message passing. And this is what you would use to implement the, the actor model, for example. OK, so here's just a quick sequence diagram. There's a main process. It calls new proc, uh, creates an actor process, and then calls the send function. The actor receives the message, does some processing, and sends it back. Very simple, very similar to other models. Um, so here's the code, Qbert code to do that. Load the sum actor function. and just call new proc on it, and it stores the, the PID of the new uh, process ID of the new um, process in the first parameter there. So not bad for an assembly language, I think. Uh, and then a few more lines will actually send the, the message to it. So you just load the, core fun, uh, the send function, uh, pass in the, the process ID as the first parameter, and the, whatever message you want to pass as the second parameter, and call it. So pretty quick, six lines, um, and this is hopefully makes it is, is easy and stuff that's uh, easy for client languages to implement this kind of thing. So the other model is fork. Uh, so each, each process in a, in a worker, each process will have a, a call stack, or Qbert's version is a call tree. Uh, and it's a call tree because each function can fork within the context of that function. So if, uh, a fork, then, is a section of the function that runs in parallel or asynchronously to the rest of the function. Um, it's, it, they're all self-contained within the function, so if forks are still running, the, the main fork won't return until the others are finished. Um, and forks communicate via promises rather than via messages. Uh, and then there's a wait instruction also to, to wait on the process, or to wait on a promise from another fork. So here's uh, another diagram for that. You can see there's the, the main fork there is going along, and it says fork and promise x, and then fork again and promise y. Uh, and then it goes ahead and says query the DB and assign the result to that in Z. Meanwhile, over here, it's querying the database uh, on those two forks. And then 
um, over back on the first fork, it's saying, you know what, wait for x, and I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to wait for those other forks to finish. So once these finish, they get the data from the database, assign it to y, and then so they, they've sort of finished the promise, and then they're like, all right, I'm done, I'm out. And they just disappear, go away. Uh, and then uh, on the main fork, it gets x, it gets y, and does some processing with those or returns them or whatever it wants to do. OK. So here's some quick code to do that. Uh, fork, and it says, OK, put a promise in name that uh, this fork con uh, block will uh, eventually set. And so it says, loads a function called query name database, calls it, and, and assigns the result to the, to the name uh, variable. And so that's done. Meanwhile, while that's happening, on the bottom here, it, the main fork just continues and says, all right, go query the address database uh, and store that in the address variable. And then when you're done with that, go ahead and wait on the name. And so whenever these actually deliver, get uh, processed, it's not necessarily, it, they'll go in uh, asynchronously or in parallel. It's not the developers. They can just say, you know, fork, go do this, fork, go do that. And I'll, I'll, I'll hear about it when, when you come back. Um, so those are the two, the two models for Kubert concur uh, concurrency. I'm saying that too many times. Uh, and now here is the failure stuff that I was talking about earlier. This, to me, is the, the most interesting part. Um, so I would definitely, uh, I definitely like this because I'm a big fan of failures. For me, that's kind of the fun part of software development, right? Um, we only work on it if it's broken. Uh, and if it's not breaking, how interesting can it be, right? It, it works. Uh, okay, so there's been a long debate about exceptions or, or error values. Uh, exceptions were winning for a while, and now Go and Erlang are coming in, and they're like, no, no, error values. Uh, so that's making a comeback. Um, Kubert has an interesting answer to this, but let's quickly go through here. Uh, so what are the problems with exceptions? One, they're, they're wordy. Uh, there's a three to two boilerplate to code ratio here. Uh, that's not very good. Uh, and second, um, what's interesting here about exceptions is that it takes the result of foo. Foo executes and takes the result, and it puts it in A, unless foo failed, and then it puts it in E. And the same thing with bar. If bar succeeds, it puts the result in B, or if it fails, it puts the result in E. So it's just an interesting idea to say, like, we're taking one function, we're calling it, and then kind of just sending the result in different directions. Um, and the other thing here is that you know, with foo and bar, like if you, once you get into the exception handler, and you're like, OK, I failed. Well, what failed? Uh, foo or bar? Uh, you don't know, right? Until you've looked in the logs and found the stack trace. But the code, it's a lot harder to tell. So if you want to know, you can do this. But now you've got suddenly a lot more boilerplate going on. Um, and it still fits on the screen, at least. So error values, right? Error values are good. This is the standard C one, the negative integer. Um, that's great. Doesn't tell you a lot. Um, and it tells you even less if you don't check it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a problem. Um, Haskell's nothing. At least you have to check it, right? Because otherwise you can't get it. But after that, it's like, eh, it failed. Sorry. Um, so you're guessing at what, what failed, why it failed. Haskell also has the either type, which is a little better, because you can at least pass information about the failure and get some sense of why it failed, uh, maybe try to recover from it. Um, but then things start to get hairy, right? Because you've got two types in the either. Uh, there's like either A, B, or whatever, however you call it. Uh, and then you start adding monads, and the type suddenly the type declaration gets really long. Um, so that's not so great. And then Erlang and Go take the, the error, and they wrap it inside a, a little failure envelope. Um, and it says error, and then the information about the error, or OK, or success, or something, and then information about that, which is good. You know, you get, you get information there. Um, but all these have the same problem, and that is that the, the error information corrupts the type of the function. It takes a function that you just want to return a string, and suddenly you now have to return the string, plus all this other information about, about the error, uh, which makes chaining function calls difficult. You can't just say, you know, call foo and pass it to bar 
because you have to unpack it and see what, what failed to get the result out of it. All right, so what does Qbert do? Qbert tries to uh, combine these and take, take the good from both. Um, so Qbert is, uh, has static type information, so every function returns the type that it uh, declares a type that it returns. In this example, do something returns an integer. Um, but at least for me, software is not math on a chalkboard. I know some languages disagree. Uh, but when we're running code in production, like, those are real live electrons. Um, and they are crazy. Uh, and so funny stuff happens from any function, definitely places where you wouldn't expect it. Uh, so Qbert says, all right, you know, forget that. Everything can fail. There is no, there is no concept of something that cannot fail. So Qbert makes failure an, an implicit possible result of every operation. This, so this function returns an integer or returns a failure. Every function in Qbert returns an integer or a failure. And the failure is implicit, so you don't have to declare it as part of the return type. And then the calling code can look at that and say, all right, let me check for the failure. Uh, there's an if fail instruction, if not fail instruction to say, um, yeah, that's good, or no, it's not. Uh, or you can just not check it. And this is, this is interesting because now Qbert will check it for you. So you just go ahead and say, in this example, you say, all right, here's uh, put 7 into x and put a y as a failure. I don't know how it got there. We tried to divide by 0 earlier. And then we want to add 7 to the failure. Qbert, the virtual machine, is going to look at that and say, hold on, slow down. You can't do that. Uh, you're, you better stop. So it takes that failure and passes it up the call stack to the caller. And then the caller can do the same thing. It can check the error or it cannot. Uh, and what this does is, uh, you know, by the virtual machine giving special treatment to failures, the language lets the developer focus on the, the program logic and worry, uh, but still get the error checking, even if they're not necessarily checking it themselves. All right, and so what that does is it gives us an interesting stack trace. Here's a, a similar stack trace to the, from something like that code that I just showed. Uh, come into main, and main calls up to foo. These arrows on the left here are saying in or out, right? So the arrow pointing right means a call in to that function. So call into foo, a call into bar, and then there on line 14, bar freaked out. And it's like, ah, oh, divide by zero. Um, so that returns back down to foo. It returns an, an error. And foo keeps going. It's like, I don't have time for errors. I'm going to keep going. Let me try to do something here on line 22. And the VM is like, no, 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 you can't do that. So it says, all right, we're going to take this error. We're going to send it back down to main. Main's, you know, it's hello world, so they forgot to check errors. And try to use it on line 35. And the virtual machine is like, all right, you're done. We're exiting. We're printing the stack trace. And this is what it looks. So you get the, the trace going in, up the stack, deeper into the stack, and then also on the way back down as you use the functions. Uh, and as you try to use the variables that failed. So that's, uh, that's the interesting answer there um, uh, about failure handling. And let's see. So is 5 after? I have multiple dispatch, or I can skip it. It's kind of hairy. I'll, just, I'll go fast. Um, let's see. All right, so clo uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that Qbert has support for multiple dispatch. Uh, it's really more like multi-parameter type classes. Um, and that is, like, if you pass x, uh, a string, and an int to an integer, it should have different polymorphic behavior than if you pass an int and a string. Um, so Qbert uses protocols. It's based on, similar to Clojure protocol or Haskell class. It's a type class, basically. Uh, and then there's a binding, which is similar to the Haskell instance or Clojure reify. Um, roughly the same analogous base. Um, here's what it would look like. An example protocol declares the type parameters uh, and a function that returns vo uh, void and takes two parameters. Uh, and here's how a binding is declared. I'm skipping past this. It's OK if it like, looks crazy. Um, and then this is an, an implementation for uh, the protocol for a string and an int. And here's what the code does. It down, down there, it just says print string and int. Uh, and then here's the opposite implementation that says, does the same thing for an int and a string in reverse order. And some test code to call it passes an int and a string and calls the function, and then a string and an int and calls the function. And then the output here is foo int string, foo string int. So 
this is just sort of a standard walkthrough of how, how it handles multiple dispatch, again, multiple type, uh, type classes. Uh, Stefan Karpinski is going to be doing a talk about multiple dispatch in Julia and how they use that in the core Julia libraries tomorrow afternoon. So if this looks good, you should check that out. All right, so just about done. So what's, what's next for Qbert? Um, a language can only be as successful as, it can only be successful if people, people are using it to write code um, and write programs with it. Or in this case, write programs that write programs with it. Um, so, you know, Esperanto, for example, not a successful language. All right, uh, so if anyone's out there uh, who finds this, you know, hopefully someone found this interesting, related to something you're working on, thinking about, uh, or just want to experiment with it, um, definitely let me know. Um, even if you would just want to tell me you think, you know, this project is crazy, uh, or I'm going about it all wrong, it's fine too. Uh, so I'm here to meet you, hear what people are, think about stuff like this, and think about related, uh, what you have for related stuff. So definitely I'd like to talk to you. Um, I didn't want to risk a live demo in the talk, so, but I'm happy to provide one later on uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, and that's all that I've got. So thank you very much. And are there any questions? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>